Well, good morning, Macedonia. It's good to be here this morning. It is 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, and we are coming to you live from 3119 Spring Place Road in Cleveland, Tennessee. And uh, we would like to be here together in person. I know that. But situation demands that we need to take a, a, a couple of weeks off again. So today and next week, we will be meeting on this forum, Facebook Live, and you can join us here. And we'll be praying that God will reveal to us the lesson that we need to be learning during this COVID pandemic plague time. But in the meantime, it is good to be here with you this morning. And it is a special privilege for us to be able to gather in this way. And I want us to keep in mind that we are gathered, even though we may not all be under the same roof. You may be in your kitchen or in your living room or in your den or wherever you may be, we are gathered together in spirit and the Lord is here present with each one. And we pray that, pray that he blesses each family and home represented this morning. So let's go to him with a word of prayer before we take up our sermon this morning. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to come together in this way to celebrate, Father, your mercy, your grace, your love for us. You have brought us together as a body, and we pray, Lord, that you would just find a way to use us as a body, that we, O oh God, would hear your will. Father, that you would lift this plague from our land, and Lord, that you, O oh God, would show us what we need to know in this time. Help us to be effective ministers and growing Christians, and Lord, be honored in every home, on every sofa, at every table, under every roof, represented here with us this morning. We thank you for each one and pray, God, that you would lead each heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you will take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Hebrews, chapter 13, we are going to start in verse 8 and talk about being outside the gate this morning. It's something that uh, Christians have fallen down on in recent years, and that is separating from the world. And we need to be separate. Not that we need to be a standoffish, not that we need to be aloof or, you know, pointing fingers and saying we're better than you, but we need to separate ourselves from some of the things of this world that distract us from being effective ministers of the gospel. So in Hebrews chapter 13, starting in verse 8, we find that it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. I don't think I'm stepping out on any limb here when I say that Christianity in our society is it's in a mess. We have become so enmeshed with the world to the point that the neutral observer can hardly distinguish the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian. As a matter of fact, most people in the non-Christian world anymore are beginning to identify Christianity not as a religious or a philosophical viewpoint, but as a political position. That is a very condemning statement for Christianity in our society because that label is not being applied to us because we have chosen it for ourselves. It's just what the outside world is beginning to see. It's hard to tell the difference between a Christian and a non. We are using our religious religion for political, social, and economic gain. And we've got to ask ourselves, is this why Christ suffered and died for sin? Did Christ suffer and die so that I can have my way? Did Christ suffer and die so that I can be in power? Did Christ suffer and die for me to use the cross 
to get ahead in this world. Unfortunately, too many Christians are doing just that. And, too, and, a, mo and a lot of the lost world is seeing Christianity as a thing of self-promotion. That's on us. And we need to repent and go before God. Because historically, when you look at it, Christianity is not a faith that would lead you to uh, success, worldly speaking. It's a faith that would lead you to rejection and challenge. And in fact, it is exactly what Christ told his disciples were ahead of them. It is not an easy road, and it is not a road uh, for self-advancement. It is a road to reject self. It is a road to reject the sin that so easily entangles us, to step outside of the entanglements of this world and to seek a city that we're not in, but we look forward to one day. And so we're going to talk about being separated today, separated from the world. Too many times, you know, we don't, we get uncomfortable with that phrase. And we say, oh, you know, that's some of that cult stuff. Or that's some of that stuff, you know, we're going to go live on a mountain somewhere and uh, wait for the world to end. That's not what we're talking about. But if you'll follow with me here today, we're going to see that Christ was rejected by the world. And the clear call of Christ to follow him leads to a rejection of the world. But it's in those rejections that we find acceptance from God. So let's start first here. Talk about Christ was separated from the world outside the gate because of rejection by the world. Jesus Christ was rejected by the world of his day. In verses 11 and 12, we find where the author of Hebrews writes, the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Now, in ancient Israel, God was present in the camp. If you go back and read the Exodus narrative and you find when the children of Israel were delivered from slavery and bondage in Egypt, they had crossed through the Red Sea they had gone to Mount Sinai. Moses had gotten the law. He had gotten the Ten Commandments. God gave many instructions for daily living. He gave his law. He gave his, his statutes, his ordinances. Uh, he told them how to build the tabernacle. He told, set up many of the dates for sacrifices and celebration. And then there was this 40-year period where they wandered in the wilderness. But in that time, their understanding was that God was present with them in the camp. Therefore, the camp must be clean. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, in verse 14, it says, Because the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you, therefore your camp must be holy, so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. So therefore, the God was present in the camp. So there was not supposed to be anything indecent or anything unclean or anything unacceptable in the camp because God was there with the Israelites. He was not to come along and find refuse in the camp. He was not to come along and see sin or unacceptable behavior in the camp. He was not to come along and see people doing things, mistreating their neighbors or anything in the camp. All of that was unacceptable. All of that was to be rejected and all of that was to be outside. In fact, when you had a sacrifice, you would burn the parts of the sacrifice that gave the pleasing aroma to God. That would be put up on the altar and burned there in the camp. But the hide, the entrails, uh, the dung, all of the, the, the bad stuff that came with the sacrifice, the unacceptable stuff was delivered outside the camp and burned at a place that we would call a garbage dump. What was put outside the camp was deemed unacceptable before God. This was unacceptable. We cannot present this before God. It is to be removed from the camp and burned outside of his presence. In Leviticus chapter 8, it says, He took all the fat that was upon the inwards and the call of the liver and the two kidneys and their fat, and Moses burned it upon the altar. But the bullock and its skin, its flesh, and its dung, he burned with fire outside the camp just as Jehovah had commanded Moses. See, everything that was put outside the camp was deemed unacceptable to be presented before God. This was the refuse. This was the awful. 
Jesus Christ, when he was executed, was executed outside the city of Jerusalem. That is why the author of Hebrews refers to this when in verse 11 we read that, uh, or in ver you know, Jesus in verse 12, he would sanctify the people through his own blood. He suffered outside the gate. He was rejected by the civil and religious authorities of his day and sent outside the city of Jerusalem, outside the city walls to be executed. The world rejected Christ as unacceptable in his day. He was executed as a felon. He was the Roman civil authorities uh, executed him on the charge of treason, claiming to be a king. The Jewish authorities had him executed on the charges of blasphemy, claiming to be a son of God. All of these charges were unacceptable and they made Jesus Christ unacceptable to the people of his day. Therefore, he was carried outside the city and was sacrificed outside the camp. The world rejected Christ as unacceptable in his day and the world rejects Christ as unacceptable today. We are seeing a day and time, even in our society, in America in the 21st century, a, a nation and a society that over our history has done so much to promote the spread of the gospel that has been one of the great missionary engines in the history of Christianity, but we are seeing unprecedented uh, rejection of the message of the gospel and unprecedented hostility to followers of Christ. Why? Because we too often have misused the gospel in political ways. And so people are just rejecting it. We see alternative lifestyles coming up and they say, if, this, if the gospel doesn't agree with me, I will reject the gospel. So the message of the gospel that we are sinners, that we need to humble ourselves before God has become unacceptable to the world. And the world rejects it and says, put it outside the camp. I don't want to hear that message. Take your Jesus and take him somewhere else. Christ was separated outside the gate because he was rejected by the world of his day. And the world of our day continues to reject Christ and the clear message of the gospel. But when we separate ourselves outside the gate with Christ, believers signify that we are rejecting the world. The world has rejected Christ, put him outside the camp, so to speak. He's outside the norm. He's outside the majority. He's outside the mainstream of thought. When believers say, you know what? I will go out there to Christ. We are signifying that we reject the world and its wisdom. In verse 13, the author says, let us go to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. And it's important that we know that Jesus, when he walked on this earth in physical form, made no treaty with the established religions or the secular orders of his day. Jesus did not come to the temple authorities and say, let's sit down and have a talk and let's see where we can find some middle ground with each other. I'll give a little, you give a little, and we'll come up with something that will work for both of us. Jesus did not go to the Roman authority, to the governor, Pilate, and say, look, I am the king of the universe, but I'll tell you what, we will sit down together and we will see how we can preserve your honor and your glory, and I'll take a little bit from me. And he did not come to do that. In fact, when he was uh, questioned by Pilate on this question of kingship, he said, Jesus answered in John chapter 18, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, but that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Jesus said, I have not come to be a worldly king. I have not come to make a treaty with your establishment or to even improve your establishment. I have come to set up, to establish a brand new kingdom that is outside this world, that is outside the things that you see today, that only those who come to me in faith will begin to see. And the author here in Hebrews exhorts us to forsake the world and to go to Christ, to reject the world that rejects Christ and to go to him outside the gate. In other words, to separate ourselves from the world. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul would write, many of, 
of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying essentially the same thing that we find here in Hebrews. Jesus is outside this world. Jesus is outside the norm. Jesus is outside the mainstream of thought. Jesus is rejected by the world, and if we are to be his, we are to accept that rejection and go to him outside the gate because we are looking for something that is greater than this world. The fact of the matter is, when we look at the world around us, even people who reject the gospel, even people who do not believe in God, will look at the world and say, there's got to be more. It could be better. Why are we in the mess that we're in? We all reject the world in some way. But Christ's disciples are those who separate themselves from the world and go to him. James would say in his uh, letter, what causes quarrels and causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James was saying essentially the same thing Paul and the author of Hebrews was saying, but looking at it from the, uh, the different direction. They were saying, let us separate ourselves from the camp let us separate ourselves from the world and go to him. And James said, if we don't separate ourselves, we have gone to the world. We are enemies of God. We are rejecting Christ just like the rest of the world. But Christ's disciples reject the world and go to God. Now, when I say reject the world, I am not talking about a hatred. I am not talking about a condemnation. I am not talking about a judgment of the world as we are so often accused of doing. Judgment is for God and God alone. And hatred is for no Christian anywhere. We are called to love one another. And because Christ so loved the world, we are called to love the world as well. By that I mean to love the people, to reject the sin, to reject the uh, rebelliousness, to reject the things that blind us to the truths of God. To walk away from that, but to hold out the hope of truth and love to those who are caught up in those very things that lead them away from God. So when I say we're called to reject the world, we are not called to reject our neighbor to say, I'll have nothing to do with you, you sinful piece of trash. We are called to love our neighbor and to help them to see the truth of Christ the glory of the gospel, and the passion of his love that led him to go outside the gate, to pay the price for our sin, to bring us out of the sinful things of this world. Because it's in rejecting the world, it's in accepting that reject, re rejection of the world of us and being separated with Christ where we find acceptance with God. Let's turn back to verse 8 where we started, where it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, though through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. And the author here was talking about when the sacrifices were made, that's where the priests got their food. When you brought a sacrifice back in the old days to the temple or to the tabernacle, uh, you brought the meat, the, the, the animal was slaughtered or the bread cakes were poured out or the drink offering was poured out. And part of that went to the priests. Part of that uh, was their portion is how they, they uh, survived. They ate part of the meat and you ate part of the meat. But uh, the author of Hebrews was saying here, that this altar of Christ is one 
who, from those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. If we are serving the worldly things, they say, we cannot eat of the blessings of God. The Sadducees were a religious sect and a Jewish sect back in Jesus' day. They were one of many, we would call them denominations, often called sects. They were one that, uh, the most powerful and influential one, so to speak. And the Sadducees were those who were, as a general rule, the temple authorities. They were influential, they were wealthy, and their theology taught them that Jesus was rejected by God. The Sadducean theology said that if God was pleased with you, he blessed you in the here and now. They did not believe in an afterlife. They believed if you did right, God would pour riches and honor on you and you would enjoy them here. Therefore, if you were poor, if you were blind, if you were lame, if you were rejected in some way, if you were a criminal, you were rejected by God. Jesus came to say this is not the truth. His ministry was given among the poor and the lame and those whom the temple authorities of the day were not reaching. They were saying they were rejected by God. But Jesus said no. You have hope. You can be accepted by God. And he may have looked wretched and rejected himself. And the Sadducees would point to Jesus on the cross and they would say, where is your hope now? Let him call on Elijah and let him say, he was going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Let's see it happen now. And he may have looked wretched and rejected, but he was accepted. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9, at the end of that great Christ hymn where, you know, Paul writes how Jesus Christ, uh, you know, was uh, obedient even to the point of death, even death on the cross. It says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ is accepted by God. And when we come outside the gates to him, we are accepted as well. That is how we find our acceptance with God. And deep down, each of us seeks that acceptance from God. St. Augustine said it the best, that there is a God-shaped hole in each of us. He said there is a void that only God can fill. In some way, we all try to fill that void. And Christ has come to fill that void for us. And separating from this world to go to Christ is the path of acceptance with God. It is an unpopular message today. We all want to think we can find our own way. We can make our own deal. We can reject God and he can accept us. But the fact, the clear fact is that it is through Christ that we are accepted by God. In John chapter 14, Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those words are from Christ himself. And to reject that is to reject Christ himself. To accept that is to find yourself in Christ and be accepted by God. There is one path of acceptance by God, and it leads us outside the gate outside the comfortable confines of familiarity, away from allegiance with this world, and to rejection and suffering with Christ. I think as we go forward in the years ahead, it's only going to get worse. It's not going to get easier. Being a disciple of Christ in public in our society is going to get tougher, but that is okay. If you haven't suffered some degree of rejection because of your relationship with Christ, you're not growing in Christ it will bring you into conflict with the world in some way, large or small, in your life, in your sphere. You can expect it. It's a good thing. And if you haven't suffered some already, you're not growing in Christ. If you aren't practicing some degree of rejection in your life, you are not growing in Christ. If you're not rejecting the world in some way, either in some of the entertainment choices we make, or in some of the financial choices that we make, or in some of the social choices that we make. If we are not rejecting the world in some ways at some times when they don't align with the clear will and call and authority of God, we are not growing as Christians. We are not coming outside the camp. So if I want to be a disciple of Christ, I've got to separate myself from the world, to look different, 
from those around me. Not to look better, not to look cleaner, but to look different so that his light can shine as a beacon through me, through us, to those who are still walking in darkness. So let's commit to separate ourselves today to the one who separated himself for our sake. And we'll find that wholehearted acceptance that so many of us so desperately need. If you need to go outside the camp today, we invite you to make a commitment to Christ. We invite you to give your heart and life to him. To say, I've tried the ways of the world. I see that there is emptiness and I want to know this acceptance from God. You can do that right where you are today. All you have to do is have a conversation with God. Admit, confess, and believe, so the so we say. Admit that I'm a sinner. I'm walking apart. I have rejected your way. Believe that Christ went outside the camp and suffered as a sacrifice to pay the price for your sin. And say, Lord, I'm confessing you today as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to separate myself from the sinful things and I'm going to strive to come to you outside the camp. You can make that commitment right where you are. And if you would like to get in touch with someone to help you to uh, you know, try to walk through that, we would be honored to do that as well. I know we're not here in, in person with each other today, but if you would contact us either through this forum on Macedonia Baptist Church, uh, through Facebook to send us a message, or you can email the church at macedoniabaptist.church. We have a website there that will link you to our, our uh, email and everything, or you can contact our church office at 423-479-1457. And if someone is not here to answer the phone right away, please just leave a message and someone will be back in touch with you to help you to uh, walk your walk with Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for being here this morning. Let's close with a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Father, that Christ would walk outside the camp, suffer rejection and humility and mistreatment all for our sake. Father, help us to be willing, Lord, to go outside to him who went outside for us. Father, that help us to see clearly what we need to turn from and to see clearly who we need to turn to, and that is your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And bless each one that's here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you, and have a wonderful Lord's Day.